an announcement. Uh, we're going to watch a video, and then we'll have an announcement following that. We'll have the word of the Lord.
Father, it is once again that we stand here in all of your presence. It is in your presence that we have the fullness of joy. And thy right hand bear pleasures forevermore. We thank you for giving us grace. We thank you for giving us mercy. We thank you for your loving kindness. We thank you for this awesome opportunity to stand behind this sacred desk and to proclaim your word. Now, right now, I ask that you remove everything that is not like you. Allow your spirit and your word to take free course. Release an anointing that makes preaching, teaching, and reaching easy and effective for the kingdom of God. As always, God, you told us in the word that you've given us keys to the kingdom. And anything that we bind on earth, it shall be bound in heaven. Whatever we loose on earth, it shall be loosed in heaven. By the hand of the adversary right now, and release your Shekinah glory in this place. In Jesus' name we pray. Come on, clap your hands one more time and give God praise. Come on, give him the very best praise right here. Come on, somebody give God the real praise in the house. Hallelujah. You may be the presence of the Lord. First and foremost, we thank God for the Spirit of God that's here. Come on, let's give it up for the Spirit of God that's here. It's in Him that we live, move, and have our being. It is He that has made us and not we ourselves. We thank God for the shepherd of this congregation, the father of this house, the shepherd of this house. Genesis chapter number three, and we're going to read verse number 15. Praise God. Book of Genesis chapter number three, and verse number 15. I'm going to read from the original King James Version. If you haven't replied so by saying amen. Just to give you a brief synopsis of what's going on here, uh, we have now witnessed the fall of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Now everything seems to be in disarray, but God gives them a promise or a prophetic word to let them know that everything is going to be all right. Genesis chapter number three and verse number 15. The word of the Lord has recorded these words. This is God speaking. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Again, to reiterate, we have just witnessed the fall of Adam and Eve, and now God is speaking to them, telling them that he is going to send restoration. I'll read that one more time. He says, and I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Thank God for the reading of the word of God this afternoon. For these scriptures, I'm going to use a brief ordinary thought. The night before Christmas. The night before Christmas. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. I'm open on this premise, this coming Friday, it's estimated that nearly 1.6 billion people around the world will be celebrating Christmas. Christmas, along with New Year's Day, are the most celebrated holidays worldwide. Even those individuals who may not necessarily consider themselves to be Christians, or even may be a part of some other religion or faith, they will find themselves participating in some type of Christmas activity. A Christmas party at the office or a Christmas giveaway. So we find that Christmas is extremely important all throughout the world. And most of the time, we look at Christmas, when we look at it, we look at it from the New Testament perspective. And there's nothing wrong with that, but in order to get the totality or the fullness of Christmas, you have to understand 
that it does not start in the New Testament. As a matter of fact, it starts right here in the book of Genesis. Before there was Mary and Joseph, before there were any wise men, before there was any gold and frankincense, the story begins right here in the book of Genesis. God himself promises a savior that will come to the world and redeem man back to his rightful place. He says in the word of God that this savior would come through the seed of a woman. It appeared that all hope was lost, that the end of man was certain. And in the midst of the turmoil, God gives them a word that lets them know that even though there's chaos right now in the world, I'm eventually going to send my son to redeem you and set you free. And he says it's going to come through the seed of the woman. He gives them this prophetic utterance. He gives them this messianic promise. He gives them this word that literally alters the course of history. And he tells them that even though you made this one bad decision, he says, I am going to give you a word that is literally going to reverse the curse that you put upon your lives. He tells them that even though you messed up, even though you violated my commandment, even though you disobeyed my word, even though you went against what I told you to do, because I'm God and I love you, I will come down and send a redeemer. Even though there may be ramifications for your action and some course of recourse that must be done. He says, because I'm God, I'm going to fix this entire situation that you cannot fix on your own. God always has a way of encouraging us even after we have made mistakes. Even when it was our responsibility for the things that we have done wrong, oftentimes God will show up right in the middle of our trouble, right in the middle of our wrong. And he will give us a word of encouragement to let us know that he has not forgotten about us. That even though we have made a mistake, even though we have done him wrong, he still is going to send redemption in our life. Because his love for us is not based upon performance, but his love for us is based upon the relationship that we have with him. See, it's one thing if you've been faithful, you've been obedient, you've done everything right, and God comes down and says, my son, my daughter, I love you. But it's another thing if you know without a shadow of a doubt that you've done some wrong, you made some wrong decisions, you made some wrong steps, but God comes right in the midst of your mess and tell you that he is concerned about your life. It's one thing when you've been on the mountaintop and haven't made any mistakes and done everything right this week, but it's another thing when you look back over your life and you see that you've fallen. But God steps in right in the middle of the mess and tells you that he still loves you and still has a plan and purpose for your life. It's during these times that you reflect and you look back over your life and you see that there were times that God really should have given up on you. There were times that God really should have allowed the enemy to destroy you. There were times that God really should have allowed you to die right in your mess. But he came in and showed you that even though you messed up, he still has a plan and purpose for your life. I really wish I could sit here and say that since I've been saved, I've done everything right. I've got it on my eyes and I've crunched all my teeth, but I don't know about you, but I was on my way to hell in a first class seat with gasoline drawers on. But God showed up right in the middle of my life. And you mean to tell me that when you start reflecting over your life and you start seeing the mess that you were in and how God reached down and pulled you out and snatched you out of the hand of the enemy that you come to church and you sit there and not open up your the devil is alive. When you really start thinking about how God showed up in your life, I don't care how calm you're trying to be, how cool you're trying to be, how sophisticated and dignified you're trying to be. When you really start thinking about how He saved you, when you come to save yourself, it will make you open up your mouth and give God's name the praise. Now, my question is: there anybody in this room that can admit that God showed up in your life right in the middle of time?
Now there's a natural hatred that most people have for serpents. You don't see people playing with snakes. Now you have the exception to the rule with everything, but you don't know where to see people playing with snakes, it's particularly women. Women really don't like snakes. They don't like them because they're creepy and they're ugly and they're slithered and all that kind of stuff. So women really don't like snakes. They don't like it. And a woman can see a snake a mile away. You can be riding in a car and you see someone across the road, she said, that's a snake. Uh, because women have the gift of discernment to see exactly where a snake is. Uh, and that's what I love about a real same sanctified woman. Uh, she can pick out a snake better than a man can. Uh, and some of y'all in this room, you don't matter what kind of car you drive. Uh, you don't get down inside, he's still a snake. Uh,
blessing here. He said, I'm going to put enmity, hatred, between your seed and the seed of the woman. Understand that the devil's got some seeds working for him. Just because you're saved and sanctified it in the church, that don't mean anything. Because the enemy will always send his seed to come at your life. Some of y'all are working with the seed of Satan. You go back to work on Monday morning, you have to plead the blood before you get in the office. Because you're dealing with all types of devils and demons. Some of y'all, you got to plead the blood when you pull up in that parking lot. Because somebody's sitting on your mouth, they want them devil's children. Huh? Some of y'all go home to some devil's children. Huh? You have to plead the blood of Jesus just before you get out your car. Huh? So that you can have peace in your home. Huh? But God told me to tell you this afternoon. Huh? He said that I sent Christ to die for you. Huh? Show 